Hello, and welcome to the story of Rhode Island, the podcast that tells you the story of Rhode Island's fascinating history. In season one, we witnessed the founding of the Rhode Island colony and then watched its leaders spend the next several decades prevented from being destroyed. As we dive into episode one of season two, we see that the struggles for the radical little colony around Narragansett Bay are far from over. It's August of 1687, and standing uncomfortably at a tavern entrance in Newport is a wealthy 55-year-old man named Francis Brindley. Brindley knows that everyone in the Newport Tavern despises him because of the new administrative position he's just been given. While looking around the tavern for an open seat, he feels a wave of resentment directed towards him. He knows that he's a painful reminder of the new government that's been imposed on Rhode Island without its people's consent. Rhode Island is no longer its own colony, but is now just a mere province in the Dominion of New England. The Dominion of New England was created just a year ago, in 1686, when England's king, King James II, decided that the American colonies needed to be more tightly controlled. To ensure this happened, King James merged the colonies into a single union and appointed Sir Edmund Andros to be governor of the Dominion. Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut have all had their charters revoked, and their rights severely limited. And Francis Brindley, the man standing uncomfortably at the tavern entrance, has just been appointed chief judge of the Rhode Island province, making him the highest-ranking royal official in the region. It's his responsibility to ensure that the people around Narragansett Bay adhere to the laws imposed on them by this new government. But to the people in the Newport Tavern, he's much more than that. He's a constant reminder of how a monarchy 3,000 miles away is now infringing on the rights that they so greatly admire. As Brindley finally makes his way over to a table, he hears the men around him snicker as he walks past them. Although frustrated by the resentment directed his way, Brindley firmly believes that while the people of Rhode Island might be upset for now, that they'll eventually accept this new state of being and forget all about the rights that they once thought were so important. Unfortunately for Brindley and the British monarchy, that couldn't be further from the truth. The Dominion will illustrate just how much the Rhode Islanders value these rights and how these rights are bringing them closer together with their fellow colonists while moving them further away from their mother country. The story of the Dominion of New England and how it foreshadows tensions that will eventually turn into a full-blown revolution is what we'll cover in Episode 1 of Season 2 of the Story of Rhode Island Podcast. The tavern building that Francis Brindley finds himself sitting in is one he's quite familiar with. Long before it came one of Newport's most popular watering holes, it was Brindley's home. He had it built back in 1652, but sold it just a couple of decades later to its current owner, William Mays, a man who then turned it into a tavern in 1687. This historic establishment will remain in business for the next three centuries and is known today as the White Horse Tavern. Eventually, William Mays walks over to Brindley and asks what he would like to drink. The two men look at each other somewhat awkwardly for a second, knowing that the rest of the men in the tavern are probably bad-mouthing Brindley. The despised man decides he could use a strong drink, so he orders a flip, a mixture of strong beer and some of that famous Rhode Island rum that's quickly becoming one of the colony's most manufactured products. When the drink is delivered, Brindley initially sips on it gingerly. But when he hears a man bragging about what he would do to Governor Andros if he saw him in Newport, those sips quickly turn into large gulps. After making his way through a second flip, he begins cursing the men in the tavern under his breath. He's grown tired of these loud-mouthed Rhode Islanders who think so highly of their radical society. Aside from the few royalists who support King James's absolute right to exert his will on the people, Brindley considers them nothing but a bunch of disloyal dissidents. Now, while Brindley might be right when it comes to claiming that the Rhode Islanders are upset with their new government, he's wrong to think that they're anything but loyal to their king. They're proud to be Englishmen, and they believe that they're part of the greatest nation in the world. In fact, it was King James II's father, King Charles II, who protected the right of the radical society when he granted them a charter back in 1663. All they are simply asking, or as could be said for the drunk men in the tavern crudely yelling about, is the right to remain loyal subjects without having the rights guaranteed in their charters taken away from them. 
Rhode Island, like Massachusetts and Connecticut, have cherished the fact that their charters allow them to set up a society where the leaders are democratically voted into power, thereby ensuring that the laws and taxes imposed on their society is what's truly best for them. But that's no longer the case. Instead, they're now being led by Governor Andros, a man who was appointed into power by a king living 3,000 miles away. This means that any new taxes imposed on them are being created without their consent. All of this illustrates how since the founding of their colonies several decades earlier, the colonists have started to create a shared identity, something that will eventually grow into an American identity. Now, don't get me wrong, the Orthodox Puritans in Massachusetts are by no means inviting the Rhode Island Baptists and Quakers over for dinner or anything. And all of the colonists still consider themselves Englishmen before anything else. But still, it's showing us that even though this new identity is only in its infancy, it's already putting the colonists at odds with the British monarchy. Now, the colonists know that they have to be careful about what they say about the king, so they've decided to point their disapproving fingers at men like Governor Andros and Francis Brindley instead. And this is a fact that Brindley, a man who, during my short tirade, happened to finish another drink, is all too familiar with. Eventually, William Mays once again approaches Brindley's table to see if he'd like another flip, but Brindley wisely declines. Instead, he thanks Mays for the beverages, pays his tab, and makes his way out of the tavern. As he steps outside, he decides that it's probably best to get some fresh air before heading home to Mrs. Brindley, so he begins taking an afternoon stroll through the city. While making his way north up Farewell Street, he passes the grave of his brother-in-law and former Rhode Island governor, William Coddington. The final date on the tombstone reads, November 1, 1678. Realizing that Coddington's been dead for almost a decade now, Brindley shakes his head while raising his eyebrows. The same type of look most of us have when we take a minute to appreciate just how quickly time passes us by. Then, he begins thinking about how it's also been a decade since the Great War between the English colonists and the tribes of New England, a conflict known as King Philip's War. He remembers when Rhode Island colonists were flooding down the very street he finds himself standing on today, and the fear in their faces as they desperately looked to escape the fighting that had their colony in utter chaos. At times, it's still hard for Brindley to believe that Rhode Island made it out of the war alive. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for their native opponents, who were decimated by the war. And as is typically true with war, the victors have been able to reap the benefits of coming out on top. For the past few years, Rhode Island has been moving on to the land that was once ruled by the Narragansett Nation, land that is technically called King's Province, but is really more commonly referred to as Narragansett Country. The Narragansett Country is a massive stretch of land that makes up all of present-day Washington County and the southern half of Kent County. Most of the tribal villages that were once seen throughout the region have been replaced by English towns. In the north is East Greenwich, which spans from Narragansett Bay all the way west to Connecticut. Underneath East Greenwich, situated along the shores of Narragansett Bay, is Kingstown, a town that will eventually be divided into North and South Kingstown in 1723. And finally, in the southwest, is a town rightly named Westerly. In a few decades, this area will be home to an extremely wealthy group of farmers whose seemingly endless plantations will produce a series of goods and livestock that will be sold throughout the world. But as of 1687, this land is still only sparsely populated, and as we journey into Narragansett country, we visit one of the region's earliest English settlers, a man by the name of James Green. Green is the first Englishman to have built a home in an area that was once home to a Narragansett subtribe called the Potawatomi. Green and his family will stay on this land for generations, and one of his descendants will end up playing a pivotal role in American history when he saves the American Revolution from being destroyed. But that's a story for later on in season two. For now, we visit James Green on a warm summer day in 1687 at his newly built home in Potawatomi. While visiting him, he teaches us a little bit more about the people who lived there long before him and about the group of newcomers who are now forced to deal with this unwanted government. The Green family has been living in Rhode Island ever since it was first founded several decades earlier. John Green, a man commonly known as Surgeon John, joined Roger Williams in Providence in 1637 and then helped Samuel Gorton create the town of Warwick shortly after. His son, James Green, continued the family's exploratory mentality in 1684 when he became the first Englishman to settle in Potawatomi. 
and it's in Potawatomi, where we visit James on a hot summer afternoon in 1687. While working at his forge that sits on the Potawatomi River, Green takes a minute to wipe the sweat dripping from his forehead. The already hot summer day has been made even worse by the heat coming from his forge. Next to James is his 13-year-old son, Jabez. While observing the land all around him, Jabez says to his father, Father, I don't get it. What's that, son? James responds. Why do we call this area Potawatomi? James knows that he's explained this to his son before, so he figures he just wants to hear about the Narragansett tribe again. Well, son, as we've already discussed, long before we moved here, another group of people, known as the Potawatomi, lived on this land, states Green as he begins his story. He explains how the Potawatomi tribe was part of the Narragansett nation, and how for many years, the Narragansetts and their great sachems dominated trade throughout southern New England. Any tribe who dared to challenge the Narragansett nation faced the wrath of thousands of Narragansett warriors who were willing to die for their people. Unfortunately, as colonists continued to move to New England, the Narragansetts watched their way of life come under attack and their once vast empire begin to wither away. The Narragansetts tried to protect their way of life by teaming up with other tribes and going to war with the English colonists, but the English were just too strong. Not only did the Narragansetts and other Rhode Island tribes like the Poconoket lose the war, but they were almost destroyed completely by the fighting. Those who did manage to survive are now all living in southern Rhode Island under Ninigret II, Sachem of the Niantic tribe. When the story is finished, Green and his son sit there quietly for a moment as they think about what this place must have looked like when the Narragansetts ruled the region. Eventually, Jabez, as inquisitive young minds sometimes do, changes the subject completely and begins asking about the controversies that have emerged with the Dominion of New England. Jabez asks, Father, why is everyone all of a sudden so upset about paying taxes? After taking a second to admire his son's thoughtful question, Green explains how these taxes are different because they were imposed on them by Governor Andros, a man they did not elect. So why don't you just not pay them? Jabez asks. James chuckles and replies, Well, son, it's not quite that easy. These taxes are coming from men appointed by the king, which means there are far more serious consequences for those who choose to disobey. However, what James has decided not to tell his son is that some Rhode Islanders have chosen to do just that. Some have outright refused to pay the taxes, while some simply refuse to elect tax collectors into power, allowing the men to claim that there's no one to pay the taxes to. As the conversation about the Dominion of New England continues, Jabez asks his father, was it also the Dominion that allowed those French people to steal land in East Greenwich? But Green, deciding that he doesn't have time for another set of questions, tells his son that they'll have to discuss this another day, and the two head back to work. But Jabez's question is an important one because the French people Jabez is talking about provides yet another example of how the Dominion has disrupted life in Rhode Island. To better understand how this has happened, we'll travel four and a half miles southwest into Narragansett country so that we can visit the French at their village, or, as it could also be called, their French town. While there, we'll meet a group of religious outcasts who have unfortunately found themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. While Rhode Island typically welcomes religious outcasts with open arms, that's unfortunately not the case for the French Protestants, also known as Huguenots, living in East Greenwich. But the hatred the Rhode Islanders have for their newest arrivals has nothing to do with their religious beliefs, but instead, everything to do with how they came about owning land in Narragansett country. If you recall from Season 1, Rhode Island has spent the last several decades protecting Narragansett country from being stolen by their intrusive neighbors. You might also remember that one of the primary people attempting to steal this land was a group of Massachusetts and Connecticut investors known as the Atherton Company. The Atherton Company tried to claim that they owned all of the land in Narragansett country due to a dubious mortgage that the Narragansett Nation defaulted on back in 1662. Thankfully, Rhode Island has been able to refute the Atherton Company's claim to this incredibly valuable plot of land via their 1663 charter, as it states how this area is part of their colony. Unfortunately, since the Dominion of New England has had their charter revoked, Rhode Island's claim to this region is now severely weakened. Knowing this, the Atherton Company has decided to reassert their ownership of Narragansett country by doing something one can only do with land if they own it. Sell it. And as you may have guessed, they sold it to the French Protestants we are now discussing. Not all of it, of course, just four square miles of it. But either way, 
whether it's four square miles or 50, the Rhode Islanders get what the Atherton Company is trying to do. So they now see the Huguenots as intruders who have unfairly taken some of their land. Not only that, but they are yet another reminder of how the Dominion has threatened the stability of their society. However, a deeper look at these so-called French intruders allows one to see that they're not so threatening after all. Instead, we simply see a group of foreigners simply trying to build a better life for themselves. And the amount of progress that they've made on their settlement that was purchased less than a year ago speaks to their tireless work ethic. Their village, located where Camp Fogarty stands today, consists of 25 houses and 48 100-acre lots that have been evenly distributed amongst the families. In the southeastern section of their town are the meadow grounds that are shared amongst the different families. Running through their town are two roads, one that leads north to Boston and another that heads east to Narragansett Bay. Their first spring harvest has proven to be a great success, and on the surface, it looks as though things are going quite well for this industrious group of religious outcasts. Unfortunately, that's not completely true, as it's become abundantly clear to them that they're not wanted here. For the past few months, they've been harassed by their English neighbors, and at one point, a group of men from Kingstown and East Greenwich trespassed onto their land and stole 40 loads of hay from their meadow. They tried to stop the harassment by filing a complaint to Governor Andros, but instantly realized that was a very bad idea. Not only did Andros do little to help them, but it made the Rhode Islanders even more upset. The last thing the Rhode Islanders want to see are these unwanted visitors making protests to a man they so vehemently despise. Knowing that they need help, the Huguenots have decided to ask the Atherton Company to intervene, something that the investors are happy to do. They firmly believe that by bringing these complaints to Governor Andros, it will force him to once and for all decide who actually owns Narragansett country. And they have no doubt that Andros will side with them, as they are respected members of New England society, not a bunch of religious dissidents who have proven to be such a nuisance to his regime. Therefore, the complaint is submitted, and the Atherton Company waits for the good news that is bound to come their way. Meanwhile, the people of Rhode Island find themselves in a sense of panic, as it looks as though they might lose this highly valuable tract of land. But to everyone's surprise, Governor Andros actually sides with the Rhode Islanders, citing the fact that the Atherton Company's mortgage was already declared null and void by the English government over two decades ago. As expected, the Massachusetts and Connecticut investors are furious, so they decide to appeal the decision directly to King James II. And as the slow wheels of government continue to spin over the next several months, it actually begins to look as though their appeal will succeed, making them the new owners of Narragansett country. However, the Atherton Company once again finds themselves sorely disappointed when monumental changes occur in England that bring their plan crashing down. It's a change that will bring the Rhode Islanders an immense amount of joy. But unfortunately, it will also lead to the downfall of the short-lived French town in East Greenwich. It's a summer day in 1689, and a roaring crowd can be heard celebrating throughout the streets of Newport. Inside of the restaurant known today as the White Horse Tavern, William Mays can be seen pouring cups of flip, while shouts of huzzah echo off of the tavern's wooden walls. After a bloodless revolution in England, King James II has been overthrown, and a new regime has been set up in his place. England's new joint monarchy, led by William and Mary, have decided to disband the Dominion of New England, and Rhode Island has regained its status as its own colony. With its charter reinstated, its leaders have already begun putting their government back together and re-implementing their beloved democratic institutions. Unfortunately, this change isn't beneficial to everyone, as it proves to be devastating to the French community in East Greenwich. With the Atherton Company losing the ability to claim the land in Narragansett country as their own, it means that the Huguenots' land purchase is invalid as well. For the next few years, the people of East Greenwich and the surrounding towns continuously dispossess the Huguenots of their land until they are forced to abandon their settlement completely. Today, the only remnant of the French town in East Greenwich is a road bearing that name. On the other hand, events in Newport do present a far more positive picture. As the celebrations continue, the people of Rhode Island are thrilled to know that the rights they so cherish are once again protected. The celebrations continue late into the night, showing that the people of Rhode Island are just as outspoken when they're celebrating as when they're protesting. 
And so, although the Dominion of New England existed for just a couple of years, it gives us a better understanding of how the people around Narragansett Bay are beginning to develop a shared identity with their fellow colonists. They've proven how the right of political representation is not only an integral part of their society, but one that can unite them as well. And shortly after the collapse of the Dominion, the right of political representation becomes a right that's no longer just granted to the colonists via their charters, but one that is promised to all Englishmen. Towards the end of 1689, England's newest monarchy creates the Bill of Rights, a document that promises all Englishmen the right of political representation. As the decade comes to an end, it begins to look as though the values of the British Empire are becoming more aligned with those of the American colonists. But it won't always be that way. Several decades from now, the British Empire will violate that sacred right when they begin imposing taxes on the Americans without allowing them to be represented throughout the process. When this happens, the Rhode Island colonists will respond with a set of protests that play a critical role in igniting a full-blown rebellion. However, that won't happen for a while. And before the colonies can even dare to consider rebelling against their mother country, they need to reach a level of strength that would give them a fighting chance of being successful. Well, luckily for them, they're about to experience a rate of growth unlike anything anyone could have expected, and one that will make their smallest colony a key component of the international market economy. After pushing through a series of growing pains, Rhode Island will finally come into its own. It will no longer just be seen as a place for the religious outcasts of the world, but a colony where people can make fortunes. From the coastal towns of Narragansett Bay to the farmlands of Narragansett Country, the Rhode Island economy is about to expand at an unprecedented rate. But that's a story for next time on next week's episode of the Story of Rhode Island Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Story of Rhode Island. If you are enjoying the podcast, please be sure to leave a review and to follow the podcast as well. If you'd like to learn more about today's episode and others as well, you can visit storyofrhodeisland.com. You can also follow me on Instagram at Story of Rhode Island or on Facebook at the Story of Rhode Island Podcast. Thank you again and see you next time.